Steve's presentation. <laughs> uh, Steve and I are um, acquaintances. Um, I deal a lot with Afghanistan, South Asia, and we, we have had uh, done programs together. Um, I'm, uh, Steve is, as many of you know, uh, is the uh, founder of the America Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, executive vice, uh, previously was executive vice president, and uh, is actively involved in the direction of the American Strategy Program. Uh, he is the author of The Washington Note, which many of us follow. Um, uh, uh, Long-term policy, pra foreign policy practitioner, domestic policy practitioner, executive, former uh, executive vice president of the Economic Strategy Institute, uh, was an advisor on economic and international affairs to um, Senator Jeff Bingham Men of New Mexico, uh, and was the first executive director of the Nixon Center. Uh, Steve's been involved in academia, uh, think, think tank, the world of think tanks for a very long time. Uh, he's got an extensive bio, which I'm not going to finish reading. Mm -hmm. uh, he's here to talk about uh, developments in Egypt, and I hope we can talk about sort of their impact in other parts of uh, the Middle East, sure. uh, uh, including Libya, where Steve has spent time uh, in the company of the guide's son. Uh, and we can talk, he can talk about that. Uh, and so I guess what I'll do is turn it over to Steve, let him make his presentation, ask a few questions myself, and then um, turn it over to you for questions. Uh, I've been dealing as, as McClatchy's senior national security correspondent. I deal mostly with a lot with South Asia, but I have over the last three weeks been actually sort of ha honchoing our coverage from Egypt uh, and the Gulf of the goings on there. Um, and that's, that's just sort of a quick reference to who I am. Steve? Great. Thank, thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, great to be with all of you today. This is an uh, interesting format for me. I'm usually on the other side, and I felt, feel like I should be moderating Jonathan and, and, and poking him uh, during the way. Uh, I, I thought what would be good, and what I hope we can have, is, is a bit of a conversation uh, after, after some thoughts. We're caught, I was asked to talk a little bit about the transition in Egypt and what implications there are for the United States and what these trends uh, may mean. And when you step back and look at the fact, I sometimes look at things from a Hollywood perspective. I used to live in Hollywood of saying, what would this look like in a movie? And who are the principal protagonists and antagonists? And what would be the central themes that underlie um, what we see happening? And it's very clearly that, in my view, that we're in the very, very early part of this production. And there's so much more that we don't know. And I think it would be very presumptuous of me to, to come along. But I thought what I could do is share a little bit about parts of the act in which I've been involved. I was one of the people uh, that the White House reached out to among a number of other uh, policy and think tank intellectuals uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in several uh, meetings that were uh, hosted um, at the White House, primarily with Ben Rhodes, Samantha Power, and Dan Shapiro, who were key members of the National Security Council team. And I have to say that I was extremely impressed on one level uh, that the White House, on a number of fronts, it doesn't matter if it was China or in this case Egypt and what was going on in the broader Middle East. Uh, recently I was in one of these meetings on Cote d'Ivoire and what, what was happening, is that this White House has a habit of reaching out to both folks it thinks it likes and those that know that are not on the same page because there was an extremely diverse group of people. I sat across the room from Elliot Abrams in one of these meetings and found this a, an unusual occurrence and something you didn't see happen very often in the Bush administration. Uh, to reach out to various people and engage them civilly and have a healthy debate and discussion so that you know any blind spots um, that the administration might have are at least surfaced. I think the, the downside, however, some, some negative moment, I don't know if Stan Kober, who's here in the room, was there, but we hosted a meeting with Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie was the director of policy planning until about a week ago. Uh, I hosted her at the New America Foundation for a round table. And this was her final two days, I guess. And in this meeting, I asked her what sorts of scenario building exercises had you done at state or had the Intelligence and Research Division or the CIA or others done on political transitions in Egypt or looked at the region and looked at the different factions that exist within the Muslim Brotherhood or what other potential opposition groups might exist. And the genuine answer, I don't want to quote her on this, but, the, but both um, various senior level State Department officials 
uh, made it very clear to me that there were no playbooks. And this is remarkable as a guy who sits in the National Security Foreign Policy nexus in Washington, we're regularly invited and we're paid, you know, ridiculously high fees sometimes to pay to participate in scenario exercises, gaming of situations so that when, the, when a time comes along, there's at least a playbook that you can look at and see if there are any lessons that might be useful. From my uh, investigation so far, and, and maybe I'm missing something, at least in the State Department and at least in the premier intelligence bureaucracies, those don't exist. I asked the White House about, about this, and the White House said, well, during the political transition from Bush to Obama and during the campaign, we did have some white papers produced. But that's a very different kind of thinking and playbook to have on hand than having the engines of the national security bureaucracy essentially widely deployed to do this. So that, for me, in this whole exercise has been one of the greatest indictments of the United States because it's been very clear that not only Hosni Mubarak in Egypt or the issues about his age or the, night, the December 2010 election in which the National Democratic Party took 96 percent of the seats in, in the National Assembly uh, or the fact that there's been a widespread concern about the Muslim Brotherhood and its fellow travelers in the region. Any one of these would have been regions that we ought to be better preparing ourselves and thinking about it. And you know, metaphors are always a problem, and historical comparisons are a problem. Uh, some have raised the point that in uh, pre-1989 Eastern Europe, the United States and Europe had done a much, much better job of at least being able to map and understand who the key players were uh, across the board. I think Jonathan is a real one of the nation's leading experts on Afghanistan. Uh, and Pakistan and the Taliban, and I would say that we have, out of necessity and largely out of reaction, done a much better job, some of my colleagues have been involved with that, in at least mapping who's who in some of these movements. Now, that doesn't solve all your problems of political transition, but at least it gives you something beyond a very thin veneer of information to sort of look at. And I think um, we need to address the fact that, that we've had an, an anachronistic approach to dealing with the Middle East for a long time. And beyond that anachronistic approach, we haven't been uh, able to at least conceive or visualize a alternative strategy that we've, we've, we've none, what we have been doing in my view is essentially doubling down and doubling down and doubling down and trying to largely keep a framework in place that preserved core, um, deeply ingrained national security interests of the United States in place in deals done with regimes and those interests across a wide variety of areas. Oil and energy, the ability to deploy military forces when need forward, you know, projection of force. Um, the getting the Saudis, a lot of, there's a lot of ridiculing of the Saudis and whatnot, which we can, we can discuss if you like, but the Saudis are extremely important to U.S. foreign policy, not because of the U.S.-Saudi relationship per se, but what the Saudis do to make our moves elsewhere in the world easy. Uh, in Pakistan, our influence is in part tied to the ability of the Saudis to subsidize their energy or not subsidize their energy. And there's a, there's a function there. If you go to war, you take on certain kinds of world. The Saudis and the Emirates essentially have an ability to sort of, you know, increase uh, uh, oil production capacity or, or deal with it or deal with the offsets. This is a side of national security, the nuts and bolts of national security that the American public rarely sees or understands, but nonetheless it's been a vital part of it. And there's a long legacy of deal making done around these issues. And I'm very sympathetic uh, to a significant portion of that, that, that right now the U.S. public is in this, in this mode that we've, we need to be with the people in the streets, and I largely agreed, we need to uh, understand, but they want, many people want this boiled down to simple, in my view, vapid binary choices between good guys and bad guys, between people in the street and criminals in government. Um, and it's, it's like many things, so much more of a complex reality where there are, uh, even among the cast of bad characters, that are better ones than there, and there are worse ones. Um, and in, in the U.S. side, when you look at what's happened and what's unfolded in Egypt, and we can just quickly run through this, it, it was very clear to me why, and I would have advised President Obama there to do the same, he had to walk a tightrope, and a largely reactive tightrope, not knowing in advance that the uprising against the e Egyptian government would work. It wasn't on anyone's radar screen, except maybe I was reading a piece by uh, 
Michelle Dunn of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who I, I, I don't know her very well. Um, I'm getting to know her, but I'm reading her material, but she's one of the few people, the few voices in Washington who's been consistently right on this for a long time when we, you know, she was in these rooms. Um, and, and is someone that I think is worth a lot of time if you have time to look and read. But she basically, uh, among one or two others, really did predict the outcomes, but just wasn't, wasn't heard. But when you look through what happened, I don't think that Barack o the Obama administration, one, figured that this would succeed. And I wrote a piece on my blog the other day saying the, the uncomfortable hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And the uncomfortable hypothetical is what if Mubarak had prevailed? What would the situation have been then? I can tell you exactly what the playbook for that is. The playbook is well known. You have icy relations, you may have here and there, you have posturing, but fundamentally you have to pull a Scowcroft. That Brent, you know, like as Brent Scowcroft went to, Tiananmen, uh, went to China after Tiananmen Square to get the key equities uh, and the key convergent interests of China and the United States back on track after the Tiananmen um, crackdown, we would have done the, exactly the same thing after the Tahrir Square crackdown. Uh, and because there are so many fundamental interests that would have had to be sustained in some way. Now things didn't turn out that way. So now we have an odd situation where you have a people's movement that's led to a, at least a temporary military dictatorship. And there is a lot of celebration about that. And perhaps we should do, but I think fundamentally the administration is trying to walk a line now between being about three principles. What were the three principles Obama uh, kept pushing, his people kept pushing. One, no violence against the public. In fact, um, today in Arabic, uh, the White House issued in Arabic a tweet with, in Arabic, saying to these governments, those who have an appetite for change, you know, please don't use violence. Please don't resort to violence. It's very interesting that this, so that's one of the key principles. The second is respecting the universal human right of people to protest, to assemble, to do these kinds of things. Now, that's easy if you don't have, and one of the things we may want to get on talk to, what if you have bad guys? What if you have terror networks? What if you have people who are not in that constructive portion of, of say, the Muslim Brotherhood, and they're in the less constructive part, who want to ride along in something? I remember living in uh, Los Angeles, um, and we had a flood of, of Japanese money. I was a, you know, then a Japan specialist. And we would see all of this inbound investment, but we also had a lot of yakuza or organized crime money uh, coming in as well. And so, oftentimes, when you see good movements, bad movements can trail along. And this is where things get tough in places like Yemen and Sudan and uh, other parts where these kind of neat lines don't work quite as well. And the third issue was particularly once you see the swelling of 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 protests the size of what we saw in Egypt, there's a point at which it's very clear that the legitimacy of the state is gone, even if they, they don't succeed. Uh, and I think it's responsible and important for countries like the United States and Europe and others to basically say that a transition is called for. You may not want to get into the position of telling leaders to leave or picking political winners and losers, particularly for the United States, because I think that can undermine anyone who might be good. In fact, the United States might pick the people and celebrate the people that it doesn't want selected uh, and say, you know, if, if there's some character in Egypt that would rather not see there, maybe we should embrace them because it will undermine <laughs> their legitimacy. Um, but in any case, those are the three key principles they had. And I think that you see the administration shifting very quickly to riding that wave and trying to consolidate this notion uh, that this is a good role for the United States. It's still a kind of modest role for the United States. I mean, the, 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 and I think what you see people like Admiral Mullen, although he was exactly the wrong guy to send around the region, in my view, you know, once you go through a whole kind of people power movement, the idea that we're sending our chief military official around the, the region as opposed to an elected official or something like that who can basically communicate. I think the, the White House has made uh, a couple of mistakes. One, while I admire Admiral Mullen and I can understand why uh, governments in the region who feel shaky about their relationship with the United States and aren't sure that they can trust us, the idea that you make it all about the military to military relations I think is at least on, on the surface a very bad move. Um, there should have been an elected representative, someone like John Kerry. I frankly would have sent Senator Durbin. And you may ask why Senator Durbin? What does Durbin know about this? Senator Durbin is very close to Barack Obama. And this is one of the mistakes about sending Frank Wisner, another man I admire. I like Frank Wisner. But the idea, and this is one of the things I'll convey in this off the record, about this off the record meeting in the White House, 
is I was the one that morning, that Monday morning, who recommended uh, that they look at something like the Marcos model, where Senator Paul Laxalt then, a Republican senator of Nevada who was very close to Ronald Reagan, happened to also know Marcos, was dispatched to really send in definitive terms what Reagan really felt and to make it unambiguously clear. And at that meeting, we discussed this, and there was quite a bit of discussion among the principals at this National Security Council meeting, uh, and them asking us what we thought would, would, if that would work. And there was an expression that it might not work, but that you needed to do it anyway. That it was something that you had to have put the mark on, your, your sort of check off that box. And I made the point at the meeting, make sure you don't try to pretend to send someone who's close to Mubarak who's not close to Obama, knowing there are very few people in this town close to Obama. It's one, you know, President Obama's a lot like a cat. You know, he's, he's out there and he may look good and sound good, whatever, but he doesn't run with a lot of other folks. And, and so, so there are people like John Kerry or Dick Durbin who get over that hump, but very few other people, and that's why I think it would have been powerful uh, to send that in. So that was, again, one of the other mistakes. But fundamentally now, when I'm talking about Mullen and going on around the region, what, what is his message? His message is twofold. One, our core interests remain. We, uh, a as Americans, want to continue to have close relations with the core interests of these countries, and we're not becoming messianic regime change fanatics. I think that's an important uh, part of the equation. But the other part of the equation, which I think is new and important, is that Obama and Mullen and others are essentially saying, that if the social contract and basic covenant between the government and the people is broken in these, in these other countries, there's nothing we can do about it. Because there is a big myth, and the myth is that we matter. And we're talking about the United States and U.S. positioning and what we do, but we matter, we hardly matter at the fringe of events. What was interesting to see on, on, on happen in Egypt was while the United States can and its positions can matter, particularly international framing, the storms for what was happening inside Egypt were so enormous, so strong, there was very little that we could do one way or another. And I think that we delude ourselves to overplay what we think the U.S. role is in, in, in some of these areas. We can, again, matter and help framing. Maybe we can matter on the front end. Maybe we can help take pressure off some situation or put pressure on because it's clear that the administration right now would love to see people power take hold in places like Syria and Iran, but it really doesn't want to see people power take over in some other countries. Yeah. That is the Shakespearean you know, drama of this, is that we're all for this in some places and all not for it in others, because we need a mixed bag approach at this point uh, to dealing with the region. So I think as you step back and you ask yourself what the lessons are, for me the lessons are American strategy is bankrupt in the region that there has not been a reassessment of what our strategy should look like and what the fundamental core anchors of that should be as they would roll forward. We tend to have been dealing with heads of state, uh, generals and admirals, and oil shakes. We've had very little, I think, broad engagement with these issues. We don't have a lot of ideas that are serious when it comes up to, to we had a hard, hard time dealing with the U.S. economy, but looking at this problem of employment and the youth bulge and the demographic shifts that are happening there and you know the fundamental economic formula where people are feeling like that Tunisian peddler who had a college degree that he didn't have an opportunity to move forward and I think that fundamentally this is a this is one of those moments in political science that they call a discontinuous moment where history shifts and what we did yesterday doesn't really help inform very well what we ought to be again doing tomorrow and I think that the White House the State Department the Pentagon uh, for the first time that I've seen in a very long time, really get that, that there's something that's much larger than Egypt, and they realize that even in their responses to Egypt and what Mullen are doing, that, that as Obama has always said, and he's right, there's an interconnectedness between these issues. There's interconnectedness uh, between the dignity questions in Tunisia and Egypt and Palestine or Afghanistan. There are economic questions, and there are also important questions about um, what do uh, what does civil society, what does a healthy civil society in this region look like? What does pluralism look like? What do the rights of minorities look like? And these are ferocious debates, and I think that we need to begin looking at them um, and participating in that as we're invited to uh, in, in these very ways in a much more constructive way than we have and, and deal with some of the, there are, there are always going to be hypocrisies, but there are big hypocrisies and small hypocrisies. And we've had some very large hypocrisies uh, of our own in the region that I think we need to sort out. So why don't I stop there? And we'll uh, chat and come to, come to you. Thank you. I, 
I guess I shouldn't say that I'm ama I'm amazed and astounded that there was no sort of uh, gaming of what could happen, given if you go and look at, at the, some of the cables that co have come out uh, from WikiLeaks of the American ambassador in Egypt, uh, uh, Margaret Scobie, say, outlining the, fa the absence of a, of, of, of a, a transition scenario, uh, of, of, of discussing these various characters, that, that, that they didn't start gaming out what was happening, given the fact that this was a guy who had been in hospital, was 82 years old. Um, I have a new boss very quickly who came, out, came in uh, in December, and the first thing he asked me and my colleague, who covers diplomacy is give me a, a memo on what you think the big stories of next year are going to be, and I think number two on our list was was Egypt. Right. So so for me it, it's just amazing um, that. But but let's talk more about how, how th there's going to be a strategy review. This is something that I reported yesterday. Um, but but how do they deal with this? If you're talking about trying to get ahead of the historic curve and you're trying to deal with all of these new dynamics in this region, and you still have the intractable Israeli-Palestinian conflict, how do you get on? How do you how do you adapt to that? If you're if given the new the new dynamics in the region, how do you adapt to what's going on in Yemen? Uh, given that that's a national security priority for the United States, and how do you? maintain consistency when, in fact, the United States is um, a regime change fanatic when it comes to Iran. Yeah, we are a regime change fanatic. That's a great question, and I'm going to give Jonathan a wonky answer um, that's linked back to what Dwight Eisenhower did, because we have a challenge, because we have essentially a lot of change happening, an incredibly fluid uh, moment uh, underway, a lot of American equities in this situation at stake. And, and we don't have any way other to re deal with it other than reactively and from gut instinct. And this is no way to run uh, foreign policy and economy. And the kind, it's going to be painful, but the real answer on the strategic side is you need to step back, remove yourself from that reactivity, uh, and figure out a process. And I don't know if Barack Obama has the backbone to do this or not. Uh, it's what I had hoped he would be about when he was elected and came in, but he's not shown much evidence of that and ability. And the Cairo yet. speech. And the Cairo I mean, speech, I mean the, the which was framed absolutely. very, very beautifully. Yeah. But when Eisenhower came in after Harry Truman, the biggest thing that was debated and discussed at the, that time was uh, the doctrine of containment, which the Republicans hated. John Foster Dulles hated it, hated George Kennan. And Eisenhower, I think, instinctively knew that, 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 that either going head to head with the Soviets or trying to roll back the Soviets or uh, getting into a massive retaliation uh, situation with the Soviets would undermine American national security and interests in, so, in such disruptive ways that they weren't realistic. The question is, how do you do that? So he set up three games, three teams, that would deal with different approaches, different worldviews, if you will, of how to deal with this problem and over a five-week period organized a highly classified contest uh, to look at the systematic, economic, political, cultural uh, impacts on American interests in the world. And then they had to testify before 80 different generals, admirals, intelligence officials with oh, um, Eisenhower chairing that. The world is more complex today in many ways and it's harder to do that, but it's very clear that the clarity of strategy is impossible if you're either overreacting or you're rooted in the kind of the current biases you're bringing on. And at that time, you had people like Kennan, John Foster Dulles, Curtis LeMay. I mean, I'm not a Curtis LeMay fan, but nonetheless, he mattered in the room. And we have not had, I think, the, the, the wherewithal and I think the imagination to realize we also have competing sets of ideologies about what the character and content of American engagement in the world ought to be. And wh where U.S. power in the, I mean, these are huge debates, but we don't have any way within the national security and foreign policy context to debate them. I say it's vital. When I meet my friends in the NSC, and you know who they are, you know, you've got the same friends at the highest level, I, uh, when you meet them and talk to them, and they're very interested in some of the stuff we're doing in the think tank community, and, and, and sometimes overly thankful, and you ask, why? And because it, they tell me, Steve, we don't have time to think. Okay. That is a real fundamental problem. If the senior operatives who are detached from the primary bureaucracies within the Pentagon, within the Department of State and others, 
around the president don't have time to think. And I, I don't think that that was a throwaway line. I think it's a, it's a serious one. That fundamentally, what we need to do today to, to, to look at this, and ever since I got back from Libya, I've been saying, look at this equation. It's much more complex than you thought about. But there's not the wherewithal to really one with it, So which, which I think puts some burden on those of us who are, I mean, he's really a think tank guy in the guise of a reporter. He's, he's a public intellectual that happens to write. I'm a think tank guy who happens to be occasionally a blogger, writer, journalist, or whatever, that we, we're all seeing these lines. And there are a lot of people who don't have these current responsibilities who can play a greater role in helping to shape what the strategic parameters of a, of a healthier um, approach in the region would look like. And that's not going to help us tomorrow, because we're already too late. Let me just ask one more question, sure. then I'll open it up. I'll because be there, and I don't know, there are a lot of 300 or 800 pound elephants in the room, right. or gorillas in the room, one of which we haven't touched on, which is Saudi Arabia. Right. And, and the impact that this could be having on Saudi Arabia, that may be something that surely is something that, that the administration needs to step back and start mm -hmm. thinking about right now. Yeah, well, the Saudis are furious because they see that we just threw Hosni Mubarak off a cliff. And for them, it's not the question of trust. I wouldn't talk, say the Saudis are all about trust. For them, what they see is a direct line to many of the Sunni minority countries and emirates in the region. So if you look at Bahrain, uh, you look at um, UAE, you look at others that they worry that there is a domino effect among a certain type of regime that will lead right into the Saudis. So the Saudis are very self-interested in their critique of how we handled Mubarak. Um, and I think the Saudis worried also about the fact that they've got about five million Yemenis uh, living inside Saudi Arabia. So mm -hmm. the instability in Yemen will send a shockwave, they believe, right into, into the region. And that the way in which they have, now, I, 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 um, I think that there are real fundamental differences between Saudi Arabia as a state and how it's governed and its systems of control and flexibility than there was with what happened um, in Egypt. While you had the, the Egypt stories number two, I think I probably would have as well. Um, I'll give you another blind spot in the media here, which was just mm -hmm. shocking to me in the, in the reporting. I did about, uh, I mean, you did too probably, about 35 TV shows in those two weeks, a lot of them MSNBC or CNN or whatever. And I went back and when Gamal Mubarak's name would come up, he was immediately dismissed by uh, the analyst or whatever early on in the, in the uh, protest as someone, well, his, his time at bat is gone, this isn't serious. Thing is, nobody told Gamal Mubarak that, and no one told the leadership of the NDP that, no one told the Egyptian establishment that, and anyone who had any real uh, inroads to the Egyptian establishment, any of the kind of the upper middle class, business class, or the billionaire class that would hang around the Mubarak circle, of which a lot of these people have homes here, so you get to know them, I knew them, all were sitting on the sidelines saying, to me, the Mubarak franchise is not out of business, and why aren't you guys raising it? Or that Gamal had not resigned his NDP positions mm -hmm. as you know, Deputy Secretary General of the Party or the head of policy, and it was in fact a billionaire friend of Gamal who essentially helped him engineer, the one who engineered the December 2010 you know, yes. over uh, success of the NDP in the election was Gamal Mubarak. Right. So to certain people there, that was fundamental. And so in the U.S. press, when I began doing this, and I called Rachel Maddow, and I said, can you get a picture of Gamal Mubarak when we're on TV and put it up? And then we did a couple of other shows and began doing this. Then Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, others began pushing. And then Soleiman came out and said, he's not going to stand for uh, election. Still, no one had told, uh, 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 Gamal Mubarak had not accepted this, and he and Soleiman basically had a tiff for the next 36 hours. So I find that interesting, that here this thing came along, it was really fundamental. I mean, you could imagine, here's the scenario, had Gamal Mubarak been dealt with on the front end of this, I think that Soleiman would have prevailed, Mubarak would have been sidelined, the public would have, the, the establishment, might, you, you might have had a different outcome yeah. just because of this. But, but, the, but the issue is, as we're sitting and talking about these events, Jonathan is granularly informed about what's going on in Afghanistan. But look at all the punditry that's gone on where there's so yeah. little information. That's reified in the White House and in policy circles that don't understand, one, how limited our, 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 our ability to influence events is, and secondly, we, haven't really done uh, 
uh, we don't have a good understanding of what's driving these these political economies and and civic situations abroad, and we've got to fix that. Yeah. So let me open it up to questions. Yeah. If you'd state your name, please, uh, when you ask your question, the gentleman right here. Uh, hello, this is Herman uh, Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a, I have a million questions, but I'm <laughs> only going to ask one or two because I don't want to to preempt others. Uh, the first question is about the Muslim Brotherhood. So I read an article in, uh, from Helen Coban at foreignpolicy.com, uh, and, and just as, as, as you were struck by, by the same uh, sentiment, mm -hmm. I was struck by the sense of ignorance that the United States uh, had about, uh, or by, by the lack of information about the Muslim Brotherhood. At some point very recently, the, the person that was supposed to, to follow them were, was following them through their website. Uh, and uh, well, I mean that's explainable, explainable because they went underground. It was very hard to reach and whatnot. Uh, recently, though, I mean they they wrote a couple of editorials in the Post, in the New York Times, so they have made some some overtures uh, to to the Western press and to the Western intellectual establishment. Is there any uh, any goodwill? Is there any uh, any plan on behalf of uh, of the White House or the State Department? to engage uh, in a constructive dialogue with, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood? I don't know the answer is whether they have a serious plan or not. I think they have to. I mean, the Muslim, I mean, let, let me just say this. The White House and the, and the officials in the White House, when this has come up in discussion, and it came up regularly in discussion in the following sense, that the White House wanted to send the signal, particularly when things are tense, that, that inclusive and serious uh, political uh, dialogue and shifts had to be broadly inclusive. And that meant with all parties that would be respectful of democratic um, norms, if you will, including the Muslim Brotherhood. They said, including the Muslim Brotherhood. And they said in, in private discussions that we need to begin to create frameworks that allow the more constructive parts of the Muslim Brotherhood to demonstrate themselves and to be able to separate them from the less constructive parts. Now, I've been going uh, for a couple of years, these past years, to the Al Jazeera forums uh, that have been held over in Doha. And they've been pretty good at bringing a broad cross-section of Muslim Brotherhood and affiliated representatives from around the region um, to there. And you can see immediately the diversity of view, of perspective, mm -hmm. of framework. Um, there are some of these guys I, I find myself, I mean, I, not that I should be the judge, that I find um, as difficult to deal with and as racist and as intolerant as you can imagine. Um, and I can find lots of others who have a framework for thinking about minority rights and the give and take of political situations. So, but the thing is, and there have always been there, sort of one or two State Department, either former officials or seconded officials to other think tanks and NGOs. And I asked them, is anything, is your experience or your net worth getting back? And regrettably, it's just, I mean, I just find myself wanting to be wrong about this. Is, is they say we don't have either a lot of interest or we will pay a price, in fact, if we make too much that we're here because they got that through there in, 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 a, in various ways. So I'm, I'm, I believe that that will, will change uh, dramatically. But let me add one last element to it, which was a remarkable thing. In one of these very private meetings, and I, again, I can't tell you who it was, there was a representative from a clear Republican organization who has access and is involved in Egypt uh, and elsewhere in the region with USAID money. And he said, we are, we are, and it's interesting, and Jonathan should write an article about this, he says, we are legally restricted uh, from doing anything with any Muslim Brotherhood groups or members, so we can't. And, huh. and I didn't know that, I'd That's never enough. heard of this before. And I asked in the meeting, was this as an executive order restriction or was this a congressional restriction? In this meeting, uh, in the White House, it was said that it was a congressional restriction, which is an interesting one, which means that it may not be something. Be mm -hmm. I don't know what the it is. All I know is a discussion had, and I know this guy knows what he's talking about. A Republican guy out in the field is saying, we need that restriction removed. We need to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood. It is undermining us, it undermines them, and it actually creates a dynamic that's unhealthy in these areas where the U.S. becomes an issue about who's legitimate and not legitimate on the other side. That you've got to be able to deal with I couldn't agree with him more, but I have to tell you, it was somewhat heartening. I'd, I'd like to turn this guy into some sort of larger voice, but I worry about getting him fired. But I mean, to, to a certain degree, that that's, that is a constructive approach. Whether or not you like what they do and whether you support it, it's nonetheless exactly the right side of engagement so that you can begin thinking more seriously 
about who you can work with and who you just can't, which is one of our problems in almost all of the binds that we're in today. It's really interesting during this whole period. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood, the, the, it's, it's called the www.ikwannet.com. Mm -hmm. Go and read it. I mean, it is extensive and it's, it's highly illuminating. Right. And, and, it, and one of the things it's highly illuminating about, and this is the, the Egyptian uh, Brotherhood, it, are, are, is that it, it, you can see the splits, you, it, you know, the, the ideological splits, uh, the different levels of, of, of Islamist thought or Isla Islamist ideology come across because they have various commentators who, who differ with one another. It, it really is an educational experience and I would, I would uh, if you have more questions about the Brotherhood, I would recommend that you go read the website. One other thing, I mean, the, 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 the shallowness of U.S. Um, uh, 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 knowledge uh, of, of the Brotherhood it was borne out just the other day, last week, um, when uh, the Director of National Intelligence and all of the heads of the, Nas of the U.S. intelligence agencies presented their annual threat assessment to the House Intelligence Committee. They're doing it today in the Senate. I haven't had time to follow it, but they were being asked by the, uh, questions in open session about the Brotherhood that they couldn't answer. Or, and it became quite clear that contacts between official U uh, U.S. officialdom and the Brotherhood were minimal if not, if not non-existent. And that ignorance leads to bad outcomes, uh, and especially where you have this uh, sort of, uh, you know, the Islamophobia that exists today in the United States, particularly among the political class. It leads you down, mm -hmm. it can lead you down the wrong road. Um, back here. My name is Kamil, but I'm like a Pakistan spectator, and Steve, uh, you just said that uh, you wouldn't predict that if it would have some very profound influence uh, on the Middle East, this Egypt. Uh, can you make any kind of comparison between like uh, three leading Sunni country, uh, who are real country like Turkey, uh, Pakistan, and Egypt? Uh, if you see like uh, on this uh, uh, political libera liberation curve. Pakistan is behind Turkey like maybe 20 or 30 years. And then you can say that uh, Egypt is behind Pakistan like 40 years. And I'm saying that because in Pakistan we have like these kind of revolution like two or three times since that country came into existence. And it didn't make much difference. Uh, we still have Mr. 10%. You know, it's so insulting, I would say, American attitude toward those people. I think it's you, you put the finger on the right issue, we, our attitude, our foreign policy is very, very insulting to those countries. Mm -hmm. But if Pakistan is 40 years uh, uh, front of Egypt, we are treating in such a bad manner, so insulting way, that if you, if you for example, Google Mr. 10%, you will get Mr. 10%. Zabari, the ruling Pakistan. And similarly, I, I think that I, I'm not very optimistic, because let's talk about Obama. I agree with you, he really doesn't have that bone. I, I admire Bush, we could be disagree with him, but he had conviction. If he would say something, he would stick with it. Doesn't matter what would happen. General was after him, they wanted him to get out of Iraq. He said, Pete, I'm the president. You know, this is, we need president who has guts, who can say something and stick with it. Doesn't matter what are the consequences. And this person is like Billy Boy, he was changing every day. So I, I think that he is misleading <coughs> Muslim. He is placating them. Like he told NASA head that, OK, make Muslim feel good. Tell them that how great you are. It means he really doesn't want to make any change. He just wants to make them feel good. And this is the reason he was changing his position every day, almost every day. Oh, first day we are this, then we are this, then not then. When he realized that Mubarak is become, coming strong, he said we would stick with it. I'm sorry that, to him. That's quite right. Thanks. Thanks, Kami. Um, Kami's an old friend. I think it's old. I've known you for generations. Uh, it, it, it's a complicated question. I don't know if I have an easy answer for you. In fact, I don't like uh, silver bullet uh, easy answers in some of these cases. All I can, can share is a couple of things. I was misquoted in the Wall Street Journal by accident. It wasn't this writer's fault. He had written something that established a context for what I'd written, and an editor came out and snipped away all of the relevant context. And it said that the mystique of America's superpower status had been shattered. And it made it sound as if I was saying that, that Egypt was doing that to Obama and doing that. And in fact, that wasn't it. The context for the 
situation was, I was thinking back 10, 15, 20 years ago, could Mubarak have withstood the headwinds, particularly the criticism veiled or unveiled from the United States in the way he did? And my view would have been no. I think the dynamic would have been very different. That today we have a world that doubts America's ability to achieve the things it says it's going to do. And that doubt is somewhat systemic. And it's not just in the Middle East, it's all over. And there are lots of reasons for it. Fundamentally, superpowers operate through mystique, not through real power, not through Pentagon, not through killing people or drones. I mean, those are ways in which you do it, but that's not how you develop the mystique of being a globally either respected or feared force. That to some degree, the demonstration of limits. If there are military limits, and there's whether, whether, no matter what you think about Iraq or Afghanistan, is that it's contributed to this sense that we're militarily overextended. If you look at the economic front and that we exported toxic financial products to the rest of the world, not really good if you're going to be the you know, world economic leader and trying to coach other economies on how to organize. Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and others really did, I think, undermine the moral leadership and, and demonstrate a certain moral limit of the United States. And so we've somewhat been cast back. I think the market has overreacted, but we're not, we, we, you know, I tell people we're sort of the general motors of countries today. We're well-branded, sprawling, big, lots of capacity, but underperforming. And China is, in contrast, looked at as sort of the Google of countries. And you realize that power is like the stock market. It's based on future expectations. So in that context, when you look at Obama and what he can do or not do, I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for him because he was dealt such a bad hand that sometimes trying to get people to see their situation differently, to make them feel good, as I think he did in Cairo, is not such a bad thing. I defended him strongly for the Nobel Peace Prize when, uh, and I got ridiculed for it, because I said, you know, at that point, uh, the, m the rest of the world was so done with us that at least creating that bridge of hope or whatever. Now, I've been as frustrated with anyone, everyone else on the question of follow-up, and I think that they've squandered an opportunity to move the needle on some of these other issues. But I think when you get into the bigger issues of Pakistan versus Egypt versus where Turkey is today and putting them on side, I don't know if it's all that, that neat and simple mm -hmm. to think in those terms because Fundamentally, what we see happening is a, vi a, a kind of viral uh, impact where the social arrangements that people are willing to accept are being driven by something else. And I don't know what that is. And it may, Jonathan and I were talking before, it may really shake up and scare some folks in Pakistan. But I think that there's no government out there right now in that region. And it may not just in, in North Africa, in the Middle East, but I can think of a lot in South Asia and, and perhaps in Latin America and others that have similar circumstances where people feel differently about this institutionalized indignities that they've had to deal with. And that may be a much bigger driver than anything with Obama or the United States or Israel, Palestine, or whatever it may be. Uh, and I think that the, um, we, need, we need to look at that front. I did, just very quickly, I'm going to put Turkey off to the side, but I think there, there are similarities, but there are vast differences between Egypt and, and Pakistan. Pakistan had, and I was there, the, the cleanest, fairest election it has had in its history in February of 2008. That vote for Mr. 10 percent was a clean, honest vote. People knew what they were getting, and yet they still mm -hmm. voted for him. Right. Um, so, so you have a, Pakistan in that sense is, all, is, is kind of like a function. Is it functioning democracy as long as the ISI stays out and doesn't rig elections as it has it done in the past, and it didn't this time? Um, and so, so that's different from what's happening in Egypt. Uh, what's happened in Egypt, where you had this 96 percent uh, uh, vote for the NDP? Um, you also, though, in Egypt, you have it. I mean, in 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 Egypt, you had this almost decade-long, long, ruthless repression of of uh, the Islamists. Whereas in Pakistan, the TTP obviously is on the wrong end of the army, but the army has been the patron of many of these other, particularly the southern Punjabi groups, mm -hmm. that, they, that they've patronized. And Islam is kind of almost th the glue that is held in a very, and it's loosening, uh, this artificial country together for the last 60 odd years. And so it's very different than, than Egypt. And, but nevertheless, on my Pakistani listservs, when I see what some of the people are putting up there in terms of it's now our time, the Egyptians have shown us the way, I think that there are definitely, we'll, we will definitely see further repercussions in Pakistan from, of what's happened in Egypt. Sir. <coughs> uh, Michael Lay, Rethink the Middle East. Uh, I want to ask about Iran and China. <coughs> um, with regards to Iran, 
It seems to me, I, I'm not so sure that, that the U.S. is hell-bent on regime change in Iran. It certainly wasn't, I think, in 2009, right after the elections, yeah. and it was very reticent, much less reticent uh, after a couple of days in Egypt to speak out on behalf of the protesters. The third element that you mentioned of the, of the is uh, still a question for me about whether, even though uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton made a strong statement about Iran yesterday, and there have been you know, massive demonstrations once again in Iran, whether it's as far as saying that the legitimacy is gone. So I'm wondering, is has the Obama administration learned from what, how they didn't react as strongly as they might have in Iran in 2009, what's happening in Egypt, and so possibly be a stronger reaction to further developments in Iran. The second <coughs> question is uh, the China. The, you're a China watcher, and you've seen that they've managed to move forward with economic development rapidly without political opening. So um, everybody's talking now in Egypt. There, the, the protesters, it was political, but it was also economic. So the youth bubble, the unemployment, the poverty. Um, democracy is not necessarily the, going to provide the answers to those. So I'm wondering what you see. Is this, is this, um, is there over optimism about uh, the cure being political? That you open the system up democratically, and the economic problems of Egypt can then be solved, or is there another model that would work for Egypt and perhaps for other Arab countries with similar conditions? So the two big questions, and I get sense we don't have a lot of time. No, we don't. In fact, um, this is going to be the last question. I, unfortunately, I, I'm an evolved Nixonian realist, which uh, I call it a progressive realist, and 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 want to put those cards on the table in the sense that. I, I tend to have an allergy to either one size fits all or the things that you, you know, look at. I, I think there needs to be a strategy, but it needs to be a nimble strategy in dealing uh, with U.S. policy towards these complex issues. If there was a real chance, if the administration, and I think the administration didn't play well uh, in organizing, if there had been a real chance to turn Iran into is its Nixon goes to China moment. If there was a way to create a rapprochement opportunity with Indi that Iran that would have been real, that would have moved them in a different track, that would have turned them into a convergent situation with us as opposed to a divergent issue where, uh, track where I think we are now, even if there had been the hint that that was happening, you wouldn't be seeing any of the positioning today on Iran there. It has nothing to do with the quality of democracy or lack thereof inside Iran. It has to do with what the United States thinks it can achieve. Iran is right at the top. Uh, of America's core national security obsessions right now. And thus, what you see and through the lens, I think has nothing to do. So if you see Hillary Clinton or others talking about these issues, they have nothing to do with ideology and principle. They have everything to do with what we think is in the absolute way to put this on a track or not. I know that's hard to hear, but that's the truth. That's the, in, my, in, in my view of how, how that is. On the question about Egypt and, and whether or not model, I worry a lot that right now the pressure's taken off, but I don't see any strategies. You're saying, well, what will solve this? You're still going to have, I mean, you've had the economy disrupted. You're going to have people uh, overall having higher expectations, but worse economic performance for a period of time. There's a lot of doubt that's been injected in the system, and I don't know how that will be dealt with. And the downside of all the potential political empowerment that may come is that doesn't necessarily make a more efficacious state in distributing uh, better economic performance in the near term to people. So it's why revolutions are scary things and why you may end up with a situation in Egypt a year, two years, three years from now or even later that, that was directly linked to what happened now that may not be you know, warm and fuzzy for us or warm and fuzzy for the Egyptian people. We just, we don't know the answer for that. I can tell you on the case with with, with China and this notion of illiberal regimes that are able to deliver, um, I would say that their kind of regime and the way they've distributed power and a kind of flexibility in a modern set of checks and balances system of sorts inside the Chinese establishment uh, is as hard to do and takes as much time to develop as you see our form of deep democratic institutions, that you just don't flip on light switches and easily get one or the other. Uh, there have to be institutional behaviors that are learned, tested, and that's my biggest worry with this, these kinds of changes. I don't think any of those models are particularly useful as guides because all of them have taken a long time to have these institutions reified 
and have people sort of sort out what their essential roles and functions are. And that's not going to happen uh, in the near term in any of these countries we're talking about, notwithstanding Egypt. So. You might just want to think about the fact that, that people in Egypt have taken this revolution to mean they can go and demonstrate from immediately. They think they're going to, they, they want immediate uh, gratification in terms of pay raises, lower prices, and right. that's not happening. The military issued a new warning today saying strikes, stop, these la yeah. stop these labor, this labor strikes, unrest. Yeah. And none of that is going to deal, I don't think, with the longer term, uh, more difficult issues of uh, increasing commodity prices, uh, food shortages, and demographics, the youth bulge. Those are, those are issues that are, can continue to play major roles in uh, shaping the political destinies of many countries, not just Egypt and not just the countries that are now experiencing uh, this political unrest in the Middle East. With that, thank you very much. Thank Steve, you, Jonathan. It was terrific. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much to the Rumi Forum. You could, why don't you?